You are all warmly welcome to today's seminar, Faith-Based Health Justice in Times of Global Trauma and Transformation. Today, here with us together, we have a large group, over 120 policymakers, practitioners, and researchers and scholars. And together, we share a joint interest and potentially also a joint passion for exploring and learning more on the nexus and the area of health justice and faith-based engagement. We have come to see in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the global health crisis we are all facing, the importance of faith actors for realizing health justice. But it's not only <clears throat> opportunities that we see, we also see a lot of challenges and a lot of struggle and a lot of tensions, both when it comes to faith and politics, health politics, health engagement, we see value conflicts, but we also see a lot of constructive and strong partnerships between governments at central and local level and faith actors. We see partnerships between faith actors in civil society and secular NGOs. We see constructive partnerships among indigenous faith groups and local communities and other societal actors. And today we are here not only to learn from each other and to explore how we can realize faith-based health justice. We are also here to dig deeper into a book. So today is also a book launch of a book that was launched and published on, in February this year. And you will hear more from the authors later. But I want first to give the word to Dr. Aisha Ahmed, who is here with us in the event. And she is a lecturer in global health at St. George University of London. And she has specialized in religion and culture when it comes to mental health and gender-based violence during conflict, disaster, and humanitarian crisis. And she is among the editors of the book we are launching today. And before I hand over to Dr. Aisha Ahmad, I just also want to briefly let you know who I am. So my name is Josephine Sanquist. I have a PhD in the sociology of religion from Uppsala University. Today, I also serve as secretary general of LM International which is a faith-based organization that works to realize the right to health in more than 30 countries across the globe. And I will serve as moderator of today's event. With these words, I hand over to Dr. Aisha Ahmad. Thank you so much, Dr. Josephine, and thank you to all for attending. First of all, I would just like to convey my thanks to all our contributors, especially my co-editors and our publisher for the opportunity to explore such important aspects of what our health and the struggles to achieve our health and well-being globally mean, especially from religious perspectives, which continue to serve a fundamental role in our humanity and the way we respond to, to suffering. Um, even in the advent of the advancements of scientific medicine. I recognize that this is an opportunity amongst a global tragedy uh, with the, the ongoing pandemic that we can focus on ways to live and share our struggles of suffering in better ways. We thought we were writing this book during turbulent times. We had no idea what was on the horizon. And I, I feel that um, the, the commitment to, to these topics are uh, even more pertinent in present day than when we were uh, writing the book. So on that note, my, my final word will be from a, the perspectives of the 
the work that I've been working on and contributing to the book is how can we work to transform in our traumas um, and the role of a faith-based approach to health justice in creating such spaces to achieve this and the ways that we can seek to heal from the suffering, um, particularly of, of the pandemic. Um, so our contributors, I believe, have created a, a wonderful platform to begin this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Aisha Ahmad. And before we give the word over to Fortress Press, the publisher of the book, I would just also like to mention the organizers of today's event. Uh, the event today is organized in collaboration between University of Helsinki in Finland and Uppsala University. And there we also have the Center for Multidisciplinary Research on Religion and Society. And then we have St. George University of London. And then we also have the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And of course, all the associated authors of the book and their affiliated universities are with us as well, together also with Fortress Press. So with this, I would like to hand over to Will Bergkamp, the Vice President of Fortress Press. Good morning to some of you, good afternoon to others, and good evening to still others. It's an honor to be a part of a truly global group today, um, uh, joining to learn more about this, this fine book. I am Will Bergkamp. I've been uh, part of Fortress Press for many years now, close to a decade in editorial leadership. And on behalf of my team, um, and in particular, Dr. Yezidis Afyal, who is the editor of the volume, um, we're pleased to join you today for, for this event. Over the last few years, Fortress has deepened its commitment to uh, publishing scholars from all over the world. Um, we look for projects that take fresh and contextual views on matters of great importance, centering parts of the world that too often are not um, centered. And that's especially uh, pressing in matters of health and justice. The conversation about the book began, um, as Aisha said, prior to um, COVID, but the matters only became more pressing as the pandemic swept um, the world. And, and so it's been an honor to see the book come together. It was um, good to work with the editors. Um, rarely do we have such an easy path with people who are committed and who know what they're doing. And so I thank all of you, um, contributors and editors, for an easy path um, to such an important book. Publishing, um, in spite of how it often seems, is humble work. Um, it's about lifting up others. It's about giving voice um, to others. It's about improving arguments. It's about making important messages widely heard and um, um, known. And so not only in the printed word, today I look forward to learning and listening to uh, people in person talk more about this important volume, and I'm glad that you've all joined. So thank you very much on behalf of Fortress Press. Thank you so much, Will, for those inspiring words and <clears throat> for giving us a framing of the book. Now we will have the privilege to listen in to our keynote speaker of today's event, someone who is greatly known and recognized. I'm talking about Professor Catherine Marchile. And for those of you who may not know her background, she is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, where she leads the center's work on religion and global development and a professor of practice of development, conflict and religion in the Walsh School of Foreign Service. And uh, she helped to create and now serves as the executive director of the World Faith Development Dialogue. She also worked in the World Bank extensively from 1971 to 2006. And she has nearly five decades of experience on a wide range of development issues in Africa, Latin America, East Asia, and the Middle East. And these regions also represent the regions in the book volume, 
where we have managed and the editor have managed to get a broad range of different faith traditions and faith groups, bringing up their core challenges and opportunities in bringing uh, health justice. And uh, what we also have followed with great enthusiasm, Catherine, is the work you have coordinated on bringing together faith responses to the COVID during the pandemic. So now we will listen to you in your keynote address under the framing of gulfs, gaps, and governance, COVID challenges. I hand over to you, Professor Catherine Marchai. Thank you so much. And it's really a, a great privilege to be with you today. And I look forward so much to learning and hearing about the, the book. Um, my challenge today, the one you've put to me, is to situate the issues that you've raised in the context of the COVID crisis that we are living. Uh, the book was essentially prepared, I think, to a very large extent before the COVID pandemic broke out. So in that sense, uh, what I hope to be covering is, is not irrelevant, uh, but in fact will complement um, and I hope to a degree at least challenge some of what uh, the authors uh, will say, and I hope that they will also challenge me. So in these comments, I'm going to focus on three different areas. The first is I'm going to make some general comments about faith, justice, and health uh, to situate this pretty, pretty more in the context of the development world, uh, which, uh, which health is, is a very key part of. In fact, in the 20 years that I have been working on the challenge of engaging religious actors and ideas more, more explicitly in the development context, health has often been the most effective, the most meaningful entry point. So I'll comment a little bit on that, then spend more time focusing on the work that we've done on the COVID challenges. And finally, launch what I expect will be the primary focus of today's discussion of looking ahead. So you have raised in this book the interesting question of um, justice, faith justice, health justice, uh, and to what extent they come together. So what does health justice involve today? What are some of the ethics involved, but also the implementation, the practical? Uh, you're looking, and we are looking, at what individual faiths bring, uh, which of course comes to the diversity of religious traditions in the world, but also what we call multiple modernities, the greater recognition that there are different paths uh, to modernization. Uh, the distinctive challenges and traditions of different religious traditions, uh, Protestant, Baptist, Catholic, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, but also looking to their shared concerns, uh, where we have, of course, the golden rule, uh, but also the parable or its equivalent of the Good Samaritan. And this sense, which we hear echoed so often today, of a shared humanity. So what we're looking at are changing challenges. Um, we're looking at science, um, systems, and approaches that are all involved in what we call development. And we've seen that evolve in recent years through the Millennium Development Goals, which were the outcome of the challenge of the turn of the millennium in the year 2000. And now the Sustainable Development Goals, which go much further and much deeper. Uh, and against that is the quite contested notion of the right to development, but the more human challenge to leave no one behind. But we also have a new focus on results, on accountability, and on measurement. Um, I'm always struck by um, Hans Rosling, um, public health specialist from Sweden, who repeated often 
that the seemingly impossible is possible, uh, that we're facing new frontiers, but that we need to do that with um, discipline. So where does the, do faith traditions come into it? Uh, and what we hope to see and see often, but not always, um, this sense of the focus on care for the poor, the ill, and the marginalized. So some of the contextual issues that we face are first, the role of public health, which is in some senses not a very democratic or participatory discipline and modern medicine uh, and the ways that they are involved. Um, issues of standards of expenditure, in other words, how much of public, public resources are, should one be spending on health and how does one measure that? Constant debates about the relative merits and roles of the public and the private, the demand to focus on certain groups, especially children and the elderly. Uh, there are many issues around lifestyle that affect the, uh, the roles of, uh, of religious participants now. Uh, one of the most striking is that a number of religious communities focus in their, uh, in their presentations on the benefits of vegetarianism uh, and the need to shift diets. Um, we also know that we need to overcome various legacies of which perhaps the most striking are the bias against women and women's health and issues of race. Um, medical ethics offers a great deal. Um, perhaps it's the, the field of professional ethics that's the most developed, but it also is, is shifting. Uh, from some of the basic issues of the Hippocratic Oath and do no harm to a much greater focus now on unconscious bias um, and the, the roles of the uh, information revolution. And finally, of course, we're constantly looking to pandemic preparedness uh, in this turbulent era. So looking ahead, what kinds of transformations this is your challenge have, that you have put, of faith traditions and public policies, do these health justice challenges demand? Uh, I want, before I move on to the COVID per se, to focus on the fact that some of these questions are not easy. Um, triage is an ancient, not ancient, but uh, a long-standing demand for healthcare that one cannot always uh, deal with everything. So it is a question of choices and ordering. Uh, in 1990, the state of Oregon and the United States unveiled a healthcare priorities plan that involved basically rationing uh, of care uh, based on need, but also on cost. So these are realities in the lives of many of many people. Overall, um, and as uh, Josephine has highlighted, uh, I have worked for the past 20 years on the basic question of what's religion's role in the basic development challenges. Uh, and one comment that I still feel must be made is that religious ideas, beliefs, institutions, and actors are rarely systematically involved. They are vitally important. Uh, they are wide, widely present as providers of health care, for example, and as influencers. Uh, the levels of trust, when they're measured, are higher. They influence lifestyles. And they are, as many in the book are mentioning, part of the problem, but also part of the solution. And yet the professional engagement, the professional involvement of these religious actors is to say the least patchy. And I think right now we are living a fascinating case study of this where possibly we may be opening new windows looking uh, to new experience with the conflict, the controversy and the opportunities around COVID vaccinations, which we could see as a living case study 
uh, it's described by some as a moral catastrophe. Some of the um, justice issues were laid out long before the vaccines were even ready. Uh, and yet we're still seeing even uh, over the weekend in the G7 uh, debates, uh, the constant challenges for the vaccines. So I'm going to turn now to the issue of the COVID challenges um, specifically, uh, and some of the ideas that are emerging from our, um, our work and our studies. So first of all, what did we do? A small group that included the Joint Learning Initiative, um, a colleague who had been working with World Vision actually during the Ebola crisis, uh, we had focused a lot on previous um, health emergencies, uh, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, Zika, et cetera. And as the COVID crisis began to emerge, uh, we saw um, a lot of basic questions, but also a scattering of reports that suggested that we should be tracking this in a systematic way. Uh, and therefore, in March 2020, this group, the Berkeley Center Joint Learning Initiative World Faiths Development Dialogue, set about collecting any information uh, that we could find and essentially trying to distill it, both by drawing on webinars and on uh, daily reports, now weekly reports of what we were hearing and what we were finding. Uh, and essentially, um, we looked at um, six uh, different areas, which we continue to look at. And I want to emphasize here that we very much welcome your inputs, your challenges, uh, and basically refining the basic questions uh, that we are answering or trying to answer. Um, the first um, area related to gatherings, um, because those were the first areas that people focused on, that religious communities coming together, in some cases were seen as contributing to the spread of the disease. And then the issues of whether public authorities could call on um, religious communities to stop gathering, in other words, to be part of lockdowns. Just as an aside, I had not realized, but the World Health Organization actually has a department on gatherings which would focus more on sports, um, political, et cetera, but have also now included some of the large religious gatherings. And some of them are huge, uh, for example, um, in India and other places. And then combined with the gathering issue is practices. Um, the most obvious, the ones that have come under the most focus are funerals. Um, the uh, desire and need of people to um, mark um, a death uh, with rituals and with coming together uh, that has been severely disrupted during the pandemic. We also though looked uh, very much at the social protection roles of religious communities. In other words, the response to the broader suffering that has been part of the pandemic, uh, food, uh, food, pantries, few food banks, um, care for people who are evicted from their homes, uh, all kinds of, um, of areas in which uh, people have been suffering. Um, how is that contributing to the broader government uh, public efforts to respond uh, to these needs? Uh, we've also looked at the very predictable responses of communities to the fear that comes with the pandemic and how that affects intergroup behavior, uh, stigma, discrimination, the increase in tensions and violence, and of course, on the other side, the efforts to ease, to smooth those kinds of tensions, to provide information, to be peace builders. Uh, this has particular relevance in fragile states, some of which are a focus of this book, uh, where the systems of governance are weaker, where conflicts were there before the pandemic, where the demands of peace building are growing. And finally, we've been looking at the thinking that's behind the call to rebuild, uh, 
to take the opportunity of this crisis, because we all know that there are opportunities in crisis for new thinking and new action uh, to rebuild in better ways, fairer uh, that come afterwards. When we've been looking uh, at the uh, response to the COVID, one overall comment that I could make is that the complex roles of religious actors are very rarely systematically looked at. The um, World Health Organization has launched new kinds of initiatives to bring in religious actors, uh, but they are not a core part of the, um, of the response uh, of the public health community. Uh, so we are still um, facing what some people call a sort of add religion and stir mentality uh, of um, taking it into account when it's immediately relevant rather than seeing this religious response as a core element, which coming out of the HIV AIDS and the Ebola pandemics, particularly, I think those of us who've been involved in this um, tracking effort feel would make much more sense. Uh, so those, uh, that is um, the very broad uh, implication uh, of this. Um, on the, uh, the sort of state of the art of where we are, um, I'm going to emphasize um, six different areas where, where we um, see, see issues and opportunities emerging that are relevant for the, uh, pre for the core seminar today uh, and for the work that has been done towards this book. Um, the first one, I think we all know, it's not new at all, is the question of fragility. Um, the COVID pandemic has highlighted that things we thought were set in concrete are not, um, that fragility is not limited to specific countries and societies, but that it affects us all. So that's a sort of general comment that recurs constantly in reflections about this crisis. A second, um, which again affects these religious responses is the interconnectedness among people, among sectors, among countries, among continents, uh, that uh, the public health demands spill over very quickly into education, into gender roles, into family structures. Uh, there, it, we, if we needed to be reminded uh, of interconnectedness, this COVID crisis has starkly highlighted uh, those, those needs. A third, which is again highlighted in many of the studies that are reflected in this book, is the fundamental inequities and inequalities uh, that are a part of the modern world, modern life. Uh, and they are very much reflected, exemplified in many ways in the health sector. Uh, but uh, spilling over into the same list that I just highlighted of education, gender relations, race relations, uh, transportation, um, uh, employment, uh, every other sector is, is uh, affected by these inequalities. Uh, we also are aware of new ideals and standards for basic healthcare. Uh, that are again exemplified in the outrage that people are expressing at the inequalities. And again, with our living case study of vaccination, the inequities of the vaccination campaign. Uh, we are, I think, struck in what we see and hear by the urgency uh, of the, that is a part of the pandemic now, that the time pressures are very much part of thinking about response and implementation as well as preparedness. So the sort of common theme of change and behaviors takes time, bumps up against the fact that we are facing an urgent crisis, which has an existential quality as to whether and how we will make it through. 
And then finally, this theme that I mentioned before of the opportunity, what we sometimes call the Kairos moment, which is a moment of grace and opportunity. We, we have to ask, will we ever have another chance to make the kinds of fundamental changes in um, public health, for example, in dealing with those left behind in dealing with inequities that we have today, now that there's so much disruption, uh, so much need, much more awareness of the need, et cetera. Um, so the COVID experience has put new faces and new understandings uh, on faith and health. Uh, and um, it has presented a whole set of new questions. Uh, I'm going to pause briefly and, and tell two stories. And uh, Josephine, I, you will let me know when you want me to, um, to shift and move on. Um, as I understand it, I have another um, 10 or so minutes. Uh, that um, um, You have uh, four minutes and then we have Q&A session. So okay. four minutes to round up. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, when four minutes comes, tell me. Um, but I will quickly tell just two of my stories um, that have colored me. First, um, when I was in the World Bank, I was the country director for the Sahel and visited Niger uh, at a time when there was a lot of controversy and uh, effort around um, uh, education. Uh, and what stands out for me is being there where the average class size of the 22% of children who were in school was about 100 for the primary grades, uh, sitting outside um, uh, in, in, um, in the sun or under a tree, uh, the gross injustice of that situation, but then returning to visit potential schools where my um, son would be going. Uh, and um, the color, the uh, debates around whether computers were necessary or a good idea in primary schools, uh, or whether uh, uh, whether um, they were they were uh, unfair. So just the stark, gross inequity facing me personally as I was looking uh, to the this, and then. Um, Another case uh, operating uh, in Nigeria when, when the cholera epidemic came and I was a young, um, a young student uh, and called to try to help with this cholera epidemic. Uh, and a doctor coming up to the young teenagers who were working in a mission hospital uh, and telling us basically, first of all, that we would not be affected by um, by um, cholera, um, because it was a disease of poverty, but also strongly emphasizing that it was good to be caring for people individually, but that the critical issue was one of systems, uh, and that the systems uh, which were uh, there were um, uh, leaving the children, the older people, and women um, in their houses. So looking ahead, um, we're looking at the threads of religion and health coming together with our notions of well-being, suffering, and global disasters uh, of various political and conflict-related uh, magnitudes. And we're looking to repair and to regrow our global health uh, systems and to transform uh, trauma uh, to justice. Um, and it is, as I said before, not a question of simply adding religion and stir. In other words, just suddenly bring religion as a peripheral issue, but to come with a sophisticated understanding of what that means, which means a full recognition of its diversity, that not all traditions are involved and not all places but to draw on experience and partnerships um, in explicit and deliberate ways. Um, I often say that the estimates that I hear the share of religious engagement in public health have ranged from seven to 70%, which reflects both the lack of understanding and the need for um, much more rigor in understanding those, but also the extraordinary diversity of situations where religious 
systems are basically running healthcare in some countries and are much less involved um, in others. Uh, so we need to understand also the shifting balance from charity, which drove healthcare in its early years, compassion, care for the individual to this focus of the book and of our discussion today on justice and human rights. Uh, and to preserve what is good uh, in both of those, uh, focusing on the individual to systems, bringing professionalism together with compassion, looking at patterns of exclusion and bias, for example, on race, race and ethnicity and gender, uh, into a much richer understanding of the, of the ethics, essentially, that are presented in healthcare. Uh, so we're talking about um, the uh, questions of spiritual care, which comes up again and again in the reflections on the uh, crisis, on ways of overcoming bias, uh, on the gender roles. So some of the keys, and I will end with this, are the themes of preparedness and how religious actors can be more involved um, in pandemic preparedness, in the multi-sectoral, multinational, um, multidisciplinary uh, challenges of being prepared for what we know will be the next challenge. Um, secondly, taking these lessons and these observations into communications and education um, at a systems level um, to look country by country, uh, as well as in institutions like the World Health Organization, the World Bank, UNDP, um, UNICEF, um, the UN refugee, or, um, refugee organizations, uh, to look at the ways in which the religious perspectives, institutions, and actors are integrated into their understanding of systems, and that spilling over into collective accountability and more focused advocacy for this core objective, which is leaving no one behind. Uh, and meanwhile, um, in the most immediate future, we have our living case study of vaccination justice, uh, which is immediate um, and demanding, and which in many senses brings each one of these challenges of science and faith um, of uh, different approaches, different language, uh, different challenges from different traditions into an immediate focus uh, with, uh, with um, a life or death outcome. So with that, I will stop and would be delighted to uh, engage in the conversation during the seminar. Thank you so much, Professor Catherine Marchal. Now I will open up for one to two questions. You use the Q&A button in the webinar system. If you look below uh, at the bottom, you can find the Q&A button and you can just post in writings your question there. And then we will address it with Catherine right away. While I'm I'll wait for potential more questions. I want to ask you, Catherine, uh, you have been overseeing, you know, the responses from different faith actors and faith groups globally in different regions. And you were also mentioning the diversity in some countries representing 7%, in some countries representing 70% of the health care system or services or actors. Can you tell us, do you see any clear global trends with certain regions moving in certain directions that has changed over the time during pandemic? Um, yes, <laughs> there are certain patterns, though I need to clarify that these are estimates of the aggregate of the whole. Um, and they also would, where people have an understanding of the diversity of the history and the present, they would see the differences among different countries. Um, it's very, um, the, the legacies of the colonial um, missionary effort are very starkly um, present. And I think you, you see that in, in Tanzania, for example, uh, but also in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, and in 
much of Anglophone Africa, some other countries, you see um, that the, the fact that the um, Protestant and Catholic mission enterprise in many countries uh, was very closely associated with health and or education. So in some countries, it was more education, some countries more health, it depended on the order that was involved um, and the tradition. Uh, but what has complicated that is that you've had um, very different histories in different countries. So in some countries, um, the full sort of missionary health enterprise was, was um, nationalized. And then in some countries then denationalized and nationalized again. So you've had, um, if you don't have some understanding of the complexity, um, you, uh, you, you will not be able to understand the roles that these institutions play. Um, we, what you also have though is quite a range of ways in which public health systems at the national level have varied. So in some countries, Ghana, for example, and Kenya, you have clearly um, worked out memoranda of understanding that include the finance uh, and other aspects so that the um, Christian, particularly Christian health associations are well integrated into the national system, but you have others where they're almost in opposition. Uh, and there's some countries where we don't have much information because of fear that there will, there will be attacks on religious institutions. In other words, coming into some of the uh, interreligious tensions, um, which is part of why we have such a poor idea of the, of the overall scope um, in other words, the aggregate statistics, but also even in individual countries of what, what role these are playing and their quality. Um, and that's one reason why um, I think your book is a, is a wonderful response, but this constant call for evidence um, and what is the evidence? Um, some of the bad questions I think are, is religious healthcare better or worse because that is unanswerable. But I think much more having a sense of how the markets, so-called markets work and, and how they might best looking ahead fit into the goal of universal health coverage and working towards systems that in fact serve um, all of the population. Thank you so much, Professor Catherine Marchile. We really, we have really appreciated your keynote address and you have really placed us in the midst of the book and the dialogue within the among the book authors but also in the midst of the pandemic where we still are and where we still see a lot of suffering around us now we will move to the second session of this event today where uh, the second session will be chaired by Dr. Villa Pavian Salo and he is among the editors of the book. He's also an adjunct professor in theological and social ethics at University of Helsinki. He currently serves as a lecturer at the Diakonia University of Applied Sciences in Helsinki. And uh, he has looked specifically at the philosophical and ethic base for health justice and faith-based health justice. And, uh, I will now hand over to you, Ville, to chair the second session on faith-based health justice across contexts. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marshall, for your very inspiring uh, presentation. So um, I, I will uh, share just a couple of slides. Uh, so faith-based organizations, are no newcomers in the field of global health. The medical mission movement grew global already in the late 19th century. And despite being faith inspired, it brought modern medicine and nursing to great many regions around the world. Thereafter, the mission hospitals were largely handed over to the locals. The colonial legacy was to be left behind. And today, we are to promote global health across contexts together, dialogically, 
across regions, cultures and traditions of faith. In the present volume, we have a chapter, for example, on Hinduism and health justice and several chapters on Islamic contexts. Beyond faith organizations, religious traditions influence our understandings of health, well-being and values from sexual health to the healing of entire societies. So has been the case with for example, HIV AIDS pandemic, so also the United Nations, the World Health Organization, etc. do well if they develop their COVID-19 programs in a keen dialogue with faith traditions. Most urgently, caring for the health of our neighbors near and far means emergency care and humanitarian aid. However, the stronger the health systems are in each region, the less there are emergencies, and the more those systems exemplify justly balanced rights and responsibilities, the less we need to improvise about rescuing the most vulnerable people in each slum, village or refugee camp. What to say then about matters of justice across contexts? First, the realities of oppression. Whenever women or children or any vulnerable group or individual are being oppressed, both protective and corrective measures are needed. This definitely includes oppressed religious minorities and their right to health. Second, consistent and transparent rule of law. Akin to the business sector, this is for the protection of the patients and of the personnel in the faith-based sector as well. For example, although faith traditions often inspire charity, the baseline of just contracts implies fair salaries for the work done. Overall, consistency and transparency generate trust and support accountability. Third, the importance of religious liberty. Even under the spread of the, the COVID-19 virus, any decisions on religious liberty should be very well grounded and always fairly and transparently applied. Fourth, justice implies the search of through evidence and understanding. There's very clear, it is very clear um, when, whenever there are alleged wrongdoings in any community or organization. Truthful analysis of the relevant medical issues as well as social realities are to be conducted and the evidence presented as clearly as possible. People of faith themselves, themselves must look at the medical evidence whenever needed to avoid any harmful healing practices or harmful alternative medicine. However, so also medical authorities should seek to understand religious persons to support their well-being when possible. But overall, the more the secular authorities take part in dialogues with people of faith, the better they can understand the issues involved and promote health for all. This involves, for example, in the case of vaccine hesitancy, learning to distinguish analytically between matters of faith and matters of evidence. But as said, faith-based sector is a great health asset. It stems from an age-old heritage of neighborly love and prophetic justice, and from understandings of human fragility and holistic health, and from pioneering examples of medical care and nursing. Hence, the more we have dialogical efforts, to ensure justice across contexts in the delicate field of health, the better. So let us now move on to hear some of the authors of the present volume on these issues more. Thank you. And, um, and I was, I think I noticed that Elina Hankela has been uh, able to join us uh, from South Africa. So, Elina Hankala, Dr. Elina Hankala, 
Associate Professor, University of Johannesburg, wrote a chapter to our book, and the title of the chapter was ne Is Negotiating the Healing Mission, Social Justice and, and Basic Health at Two Methodist Inner City Missions in South Africa. In my chapter, I explore the relationship between social justice and concrete service at two Methodist inner city missions in South Africa. Based on my involvement with these missions, I argue that in a socioeconomically highly unequal context of South Africa, social justice cannot be simply about working towards defeating injustice at the structural level, but necessarily also involves concrete social service that allows people to cope with the challenges. Both city missions run a number of social projects that were motivated by a vision of affirming human dignity. And among the projects were those that addressed basic health issues directly, like an HIV and AIDS testing and counseling center. Other projects rather addressed health from a holistic societal perspective. While these projects addressed the, the needs of individuals, they were underpinned by a theological vision that opposed the privatized understanding of faith and rather understood the role of faith, of a faith community to be part of the city and responsive to the needs of the surrounding neighborhood. Both of the case study missions had gone through what could be called a reopening towards the needs of the city some decades ago. And when now observing their work, I argue, as I've already said, that within their theological framework, social justice here understood as the actualization of respect for human dignity and basic health emerge as organic, non-hierarchical aspects of a single mission. You could have basic health initiatives without social justice, but you cannot have social justice without, without also caring for people's basic health needs. Yet, as I also conclude in the chapter, the relationship between coping and defeating calls for further interrogation. Based on the data used in this chapter, I cannot say much about the broader societal impact or lack thereof of these missions in challenging the inequality in the city. So while the chapter highlights the importance of hands-on service in the context of justice-driven ministry, it does not aim to undermine the importance of structural change. So at the present moment, as COVID-19 is shining light on global, inequ global inequality, this case study chapter speaks to a broader context. If we position urban South Africa as a microcosm of global inequality. The South African Methodist wisdom and experience would then draw the attention to the potential of faith communities in caring for communities that are struggling with the virus. But this case study also calls for discussion on the theological assets faith communities may have. If we wish not do not only address coping with the pandemic, but also call people of faith to expose global injustice and imagine new al alternatives of, of dignified being in the world. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hankela. So, and uh, now, now we move on to um, Tanzania. Uh, Josephine Sunquist, um, so you serve currently as a Secretary General of, of LM International Stockholm. And, and you have written in our book uh, a chapter uh, that is titled Toward Basic Health Justice, Grassroots Challenges in Church-Related Health Services in Tanzania. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Villa. And I think it's really interesting, Catherine, when you noticed in your key address countries with a strong history of missionary societies. You were mentioning countries like DRC and Tanzania, and that, that's an example of countries where LM International operates today with local faith partners to run healthcare services. And what I've looked into in, in, in the research that gives and, and serves as the foundation for the chapter is a study that took place during five years in Tanzania. And I conducted the research in close dialogue and cooperation with a Tanzanian sociologist of religion, Thomas and De Luca. So we have written and presented the chapter in the book together. And 
we looked into the public-private partnership in health in Tanzania, and we were trying to see uh, what struggle occurs when faith actors enter into these public relationships with the Ministry of Health and local public health facilities and, and uh, authorities. And what we've seen in the chapter that you can read is that one of the challenges regards the critical voice function, because suddenly civil society actors that were previously funded internationally for their services are now in a more of a financial dependency with the state. And when the state is not moving in a democratic direction, it becomes challenging to act as a critical voice, criticizing the same government that is funding your core services. And in a sharp situation where you have to make a choice, it can be really tough. Should you stand up and defend human rights and see more suffering in your communities? And that has come out clearly in the study as a struggle for all the concerned uh, faith organizations, including the Lutheran, Catholic and Pentecostal movement in Tanzania. Second point I want to quickly mention is about integration of faith-based health services into the national health system, both when it comes to contribution in comprehensive health planning, but also SDG data on SDG 3, the right to health. There are several struggles here because faith actors often want to contribute, but they lack the resources or the capacity to tap into the national system. On the other hand, ministers of health and the local authorities in the case of Tanzania as for this chapter, do not have the right means and methodologies to apply a public private composition in comprehensive health planning. It is based on more of a single public system. So there needs to be a transformation in this. Finally, I wanna raise innovation. Please, because, quickly. Yes, yeah. and this is my last point. And innovation, was not built into the public-private reform in health. So faith actors have been compensated for the services delivered, but in terms of expanding and innovating in health, there is a lack of financing for that, which also caused, of course, struggles, but also opportunities to work in new innovative partnerships. I stop there, thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Dr. Josephine Sundquist, and we, we will um, continue on Tanzanian issues. So we have here Professor Auli Vähäkangas, Professor of Practical Theology from the University of Helsinki, and her chapter in, in the book in question was titled Traditional Christian and Modern Approaches to Masculinity, Health Care Volunteers in Tanzania. So Auli. Thank you very much, Ville. Very nice to continue after Josephine, because our chapters link so nicely. So my chapter analyzes the construction of masculinity among male care volunteers of a Christian palliative care program in northern Tanzania during the HIV AIDS pandemic. The findings of the study indicate that it was important to have both male and female volunteers to take care of the dying members of the community. The presence of male volunteers also reduced stigma of the HIV virus in the community. The findings further reveal that male volunteers construct their masculine identities primarily, primarily from a traditional male identity and central in it is their leadership and the role of counseling in the community. At the same time, men adapt a modern masculine identity. So the studied volunteers act as good example of transforming masculinities in the face of a pandemic. The most important lesson into the situation of Corona pandemic is that when talking of faith-based health justice, it is essential to have the support of the whole community to combat the pandemic. For a real transformation, we need flexible gender roles, which make it easier to construct one's identity in a challenging situation. The transformation of masculinities 
among the studied healthcare volunteers reflects the search for wholeness in which goal is to reach balance in life. In Swahili, wholeness, uzima, is a broader concept than the English single word wholeness. Uzima can be translated as vitality, adulthood, completeness, energy, existence, maturity, and perfection. All these are threatened by pandemics. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Auli Vahakanga. So now, now we move on to Islamic contexts. And uh, we should have here Dr. Abu Sayem, Associate Professor in the Department of World Religions and Cultures at the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, he, he has written um, on Islamic faith for health and the welfare in the globalizing South Asia, the case of Bangladesh. Okay, thank you so much for uh, giving me an opportunity to share my ideas with you all. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Almighty God, who is most merciful, most gracious. Please take my son greetings. Assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. So as you hear, the title of my uh, chapter was Islamic Faith for Health and Welfare in the global, Globalizing South Asia, the case of Bangladesh. So uh, in this chapter, uh, first of all, I address some Islamic uh, uh, moral guidelines for health and welfare for, uh, in human life. So according to Islamic principles, uh, 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 health uh, is a uh, holistic idea which includes four basic things. Number one, spiritual soundness of a person. Number two, the physical capability of the same person. Number three, mental freshness. And some last one, the fourth number four, the social fitness. So uh, we can't uh, make differentiate, differentiate uh, between uh, spiritual and bodily or uh, mental and social fitness. So all these things are very ac accumulated and connected. So when we talk about the health, that means we also talk and connect the spiritual mind of the same person. So without the spiritual uh, soundness, we can't make the person physically fit and, and, and capable. That's why the first things in this, according to Islamic belief systems, the, the, the physical, uh, sorry, the spiritual soundness is very, very important. Uh, uh, Islam uh, believes that uh, it is also the maxim uh, all over the world that the prevention is better than cure. So uh, as our prophet, the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, uh, he always suggests his followers that uh, when you are going to uh, practice a good things, you have to control some, some very vital issues. For example, food habits. So, so uh, basically the disease comes from food habits and bad practices. So that's why uh, the prophet said that uh, when you take food, you have to think that you can take food when one third of your stomach and one third should be, uh, should be kept for, uh, for water and another one third should be kept for bathing. That it is the very healthy habit heavy situation of food habits. So, uh, and at the same time, Prophet Sallallahu said that uh, uh, you have to continue a lifestyle that must be in balance and ideal and model. So, uh, if we make up, make uh, our life balancing with the environment, with our surrounding uh, surrounding existence, I think uh, it makes me happy. So uh, uh, in principle, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic concept of health uh, dealt with uh, two basic things. Number one, Iman, that means belief. And number other thing is Amal, that means practices. So uh, it, Iman means the strong faith in God. So when a person has strong faith in God, uh, his, uh, his spiritual soundness will be very stronger and that can reduce some kind of pressures, stresses, and anxieties and other things that, that reduce the, the psychological uh, illness and sickness and other things. Islamic uh, concept of health actually is a grace of God. So if we, uh, if we really get to God, that God has given me a chance to live on this earth and we have to be 
uh, we, we have to praise and glorify God for this kind of grace that it, it, uh, it, this kind of special realization make, make, make us happy. So uh, then I, I look to the case of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, in uh, in uh, this country, we are following uh, uh, in some ways Islamic uh, traditional medicine systems. Uh, but you know the in the modern medicines is uh, this this are, is an, this uh, is very common to all countries that's why our traditional uh, medical systems and treatment systems are are not uh, are not giving prioritized uh, if we compare that uh, in modern system in modern medical system treatment systems uh, in healthcare systems uh, there are some uh, faith based organizations like uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, could you could you please come to your conclusions? Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. So uh, my initial finding is that uh, uh, in pri in in, pub uh, in public uh, medical centers, uh, uh, they are giving some free treatments for the patients, but their quality is very very poor. On the other hand, we have some private private medical uh, and health healthcare facilities. Uh, they are selective, but only this person can get the medical uh, facilities, uh, facilities from them. On, on the other hand, there are third layer that we have some faith-based organization, uh, organizations uh, which can give some uh, uh, healthcare facilities for uh, poor person, for, for middle class people, for risk, risk persons. So if the government can give some uh, uh, subsidiaries and some helps and donor organizations can give some promotions to uh, faith-based organizations. I think uh, the acute problem in our country in regard to health sectors. Uh, so in the private-public partnership and especially with the, some non 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 government organizations and and faith-based organizations can promote this kind of facilities for Bangladesh people. Thank okay. you so much for hearing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for this very important message from, from Bangladesh. And uh, we may have time for one question after the following presentations, but now we move. Uh, so you can write it already to the Q&A field if you want to ask one question. But now we move on to Saudi Ara uh, issues of Saudi Arabia. And uh, Dr. Hanna Albane seems to be there present. So. Uh, she's uh, a training and development manager from Surah Management Consultants uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and she wrote on our book on Islamic health justice for women in Saudi Arabia. So um, please, uh, Dr. Albani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barfa. Thank you, everyone. I am Dr. Hannah Albani, the author of the chapter Islamic Health Justice for Women in Saudi Arabia. I wrote this chapter at the time when Saudi Arabia, my home country, was undergoing major social and political transformations. The Saudi culture has become integrative to women's rights and independence. Interestingly, the recent reform actions to women's rights in Saudi Arabia depict the change to women's status during early Islam. In my observation, the young Saudi generation has embraced this cultural transformation and the concept of gender equality. When I study Islam, however, I find that although Islam treats men and women equally in spirituality and in their cap capabilities to perform good deeds, it has considered the physical and psychological differences between men and women. For example, men are obligated to provide emotional and financial securities to women while women are expected to center their roles in social education. Health justice to women in Saudi Arabia corresponds with the principles of gender equity in Islam and also the theory of health and social justice. That's actually the core of my chapter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Albani. And uh, now, now we move back to uh, Europe, uh, and uh, in particular to Finland, uh, we have here Dr. Henrietta Grönlund, a professor of urban theology, University of Helsinki. And her chapter in our book uh, was on empirical perspective on religion and health justice, the case in Finland and across cultures. So Henrietta, you're welcome. Thank you so much. 
Indeed, my chapter in the book uh, focuses on the roles of religion and religious agents in health justice and, and also social services in today's Western diverse and from some viewpoints also secularizing context, particularly Finland. And in the book, uh, I conclude based on recent empirical research that despite changes in religious landscapes, religion continues to hold an important place in questions of health and social justice, also in Western contexts. This conclusion has once again been affirmed by recent research, also my own recent projects, where we research COVID-19 related social work and community resilience. Our preliminary results show that the role of religious agents has been crucial also in a welfare state like Finland. For example, the city of Helsinki, the capital of, of Finland and the Evangelical Lutheran Majority Church jointly organized an extensive service for all residents over 70 years of age who were in quarantine in the spring of last year. The service combined a proactive helpline and food and medicine delivery. And the service organization was actually built on local congregations. One leading city official even stated in our research interview that the city provided public service through the church and that the city could not have provided this service on its own. Another example has been the role of religious communities in supporting and reaching migrant groups who, for example, needed information in their own language. These recent experiences highlight once again the continuing role of religion and religious agents in health and social justice. And uh, in some Western societies, religion is sometimes viewed as something that is disappearing or something that should be isolated from public space. And I think it now remains to be seen whether these uh, recent developments strengthen a more public role of religion and whether religion will be increasingly viewed as an asset and opportunity in joint efforts for health justice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Henrietta Grönlund, uh, very much. And uh, uh, last, the last but not least, uh, we will still have one author from, from our book. There are many more authors, you, you, but, but, but here we have Dr. Thomas Renkert from the Institute of Diaconia Science, University of Heidelberg. And um, his chapter in, in the book was titled Healing and Salvation, the relation of health and religion in the context of Christianity. So Dr. Renkert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, inviting me to this uh, talk. Yes, my paper tries to outline a sort of grammar on how to understand the relationship between health and faith from a Christian perspective. When I wrote this paper, I wanted to give a couple of general remarks on how to think about this relationship. Um, religious hope on the one hand, salvation, redemption, deliverance, and medicinal hope, being cured from an illness, staying healthy into old age, or being able to live with a disability. Religion plays a major role, not only for how a society understands sickness, old age, disability, and health, but also how individuals are able to make sense of their personal fate and cope with their suffering. I was looking at different examples at the time I wrote this article, but now the corona pandemic has brought these kinds of entanglements into focus. Entanglements between universal idea uh, and valuation of health on the one hand, and a whole set of background variables like culture, subcultures, faith, political convictions, and so on, on the other hand. And in most societies hit with the coronavirus, a debate has started whether or not religious communities should protest more against governmental restrictions due to the virus, or whether they should step aside and uh, as not to cause even more suffering. But back to my paper. After an introduction into some of these relationships from the standpoint of Christianity, I then go on and develop a preliminary typology, a set of models that should help interpreting these kinds of entanglements by using a sort of grammar. The paper closes with the idea of global health as a future task. Um, but 
yeah, COVID-19 has made it clear that this future is already very much here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas Renke. Uh, there's, there's one uh, rather long question here. So I, I will return to it in a moment, but could, could you please, uh, well, for me, meanwhile, I, I would ask a short question on Dr. Albani. So how about COVID-19 in Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia? What, what sort of impacts have, have the, the pandemic had, especially on women in Saudi Arabia? I think like the situation for um, both men and women are not very different really. But what I, found, what I find here is that some women, especially those who have children, find the pandemic, especially during the lockdown, an opportunity for them to reconnect with the family, to be together with their husbands, to be together with their children, and to reestablish or rethink through the relationship. Um, as you may know, uh, lifting the ban on driving hasn't been long in this country, um, but it was very unfortunate. Like, you know, once women were allowed to drive, like, I mean, even for me, my car, um, stayed in the parking for about two, three months because the curfew. Um, so yeah, like it's, 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 it's something that in a way has intervened with all the changes um, in the situation to women. But um, I think it's more like um, it was a barrier for further developments or further improvement to women's situation. Uh, when I talk about, you know, when I link it to health, I think I should link it more to the psychosocial health to women because uh, I'm sure the pandemic has um, an impact on everyone, like regardless of their gender. But with women in Saudi, like they were so excited. I mean, we have we were so excited for all the changes uh, that integrate women's rights, but then the pandemic was just um, a barrier. Um, to absorb that observation and that improvement. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we will take this one question uh, from, from the UNA. So um, this is, uh, I think this goes to Professor Elina Hankela because it is um, about on, on South African context. So the one who is asking is a little bit worried about the training of local churches uh, personnel um, on uh, the topical health issues and especially the ones that go beyond uh, spiritual health. So how do you see, Elena, the, the situation in terms of training of uh, pastors and uh, other people uh, who are somehow involved in, in the health sector work in uh, South Africa? Um. I'm, I'm, I'm a typical academic, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm going to answer something that relates to the, to the question. So I think that, um, was it, is it Tokozili? I think I missed the name. Anyway, the question points us to the direction of power relations and, and, and buy-in and thinking of whose projects are these and whose vision is this. Um, so I think that I don't know the Anglican context here, um, and obviously the, the person asking the question knows that much better, but in the context of my own chapter, um, I do also discuss it, and I have written about it elsewhere as well, how many of the members of the local congregation, even the congregation where the, where the projects were run, would not be that involved in the everyday of, of, of those projects. So I think that it's a, it could be, it could be very different, but it could, it could have something similar to it of, of that. How, how, do, how, how, how does the broader faith community, um, the people of faith together find this kind of visions, um, life affirming and, and speaking and resonating with the faith. Um, so I think training, training is, is then the next step. And I mean, in this, in the context that the question comes from, maybe, maybe there are additional issues with obviously, but I think that's where I would start, start wondering um, what, what the direction should be uh, of the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. I think somebody yes. else would also answer. I think it's not a South African specific. Um, so if somebody has like 
Yeah, yeah, maybe we have one minute yeah. of if, if some of the panelists want to add the issue of training of um, especially professional people of faith uh, in, in the context of uh, health projects. Um, I could respond just briefly and say that this has also come out clearly in my research from the Tanzanian context, the need for management program for hospital directors and health directorates within faith organizations, because often uh, the leadership has grown over time in an authentic way, but not to the same manner in a professional sense. So I, I would say that there is a severe need to invest and in management training for the realization of, of health justice and also for the incorporation of faith-based health entities into systems approaches. I can also comment that World Vision has done a lot of work on this um, with the Channels of Hope program that essentially use texts in engagement with religious leaders. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Would you like to continue still, Professor Marshall, a bit? Or... OK. May so this uh, reproductive health is clearly one of the more sensitive issues. And another thing that's come out of various studies is that the language used can be very important. Um, and it is because there is a lot of conflating of family planning and abortion and um, a lot of a lot of mythology um, that is is a part of the discourse. Thank you so much. I think we are now. Um, it, it is now time to move on. So uh, we are about to start our last session, session three, and this will be chaired by Dr. Aisha Ahmad. Uh, Aisha, please. Thank you so much. So um, I'm, with great honor, I'm going to introduce our second keynote speaker, Professor Simon Dean. So he, uh, Professor Dean has many accolades that I can uh, attribute to his career. He's a consultant psychiatrist joining us from his hospital at the moment, working in palliative medicine, and also has a career as an anthropologist um, with much experience with the roles of spirituality and religion and mental health, particularly from Jewish and Islamic communities, um, including in the UK. Um, I've learned a great deal from Professor Deal throughout my career, and I'm very privileged to have this opportunity to extend my thanks to him here for, for that, but also for his contributions to the, the chapter, which he co-authored with another colleague, uh, Dr. Khaldun Ahmed, who's unable to join us today. Um, so Professor Dean's talk is, is called Religion, Coping and Trauma. And I think he's a great speaker to, to have to, to close this event um, and thinking about ways we can move forward uh, from the pandemic and the, the role in religion in responding to, to the mental health aspects. Um, that we've all been suffering from globally. So I'll hand over to you now, uh, Simon. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Hello to everyone. It's baking hot in London at the moment. So we've almost evaporated. I'm going to be fairly different from everyone. So I'm not specifically going to talk about the book, although Dr. Ahmed and myself did write a chapter on psychosis amongst Bangladeshis. Most of my fieldwork as an anthropologist over the last 20 years has settled on the question of religion and coping, and particularly the question of trauma and how religion helps cope with trauma, but more so, what effect does trauma have on religious belief? Does religion diminish or does it accentuate religious belief and why? And one of the areas I'm currently researching is the area of theodicy, the question if God is good, omnipotent and omniscient, how do people explain suffering in the world? So just to put things into context, much of my PhD fieldwork and my writing over the last, so I suppose, decade, has looked at cognitive dissonance. I lived amongst a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews in London 
who were messianic. They believed that their religious leader, called Menachem Schneerson, who was 92 years of age when he died, was a Jewish messiah. So I lived amongst a group called Lubavitch, and I followed them up over about 20 years when their leader died. And I looked at how they dealt with cognitive dissonance. So my question was, if they really believed he was a messiah, what happened to their religious beliefs? And as Festinger et al, who wrote in 1957, when Prophecy Fells wrote their key text, in fact, I found not only when this man died, did they believe he hadn't actually died, he was in occultation, he was hidden, or in fact, that he was dead, but he would be resurrected, very much like the Christian belief. I found the belief in him being the Messiah and the fact that the world, the redemption would arrive imminently, actually intensify remarkably. So what I actually found was that when prophecy is disconfirmed, far from losing religious beliefs, in fact, people actually can intensify it. Whether they do or don't depends on many factors. One particular factor is the degree of social support which they have surrounding that religious belief. So recently, I've written a paper for a journal called um, Mental Health, Religion and Culture, where I've looked at the Holocaust, and I looked at how 70 years after the Holocaust, Jewish belief persists. And I looked at what happened during and shortly after the Holocaust in the concentration camps, how did the Jews persist in their religious beliefs? What sort of theodicies did they have? So basically, reviewing the literature on trauma, what we find commonly amongst religious populations, both in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, is that amongst orthodox populations, highly religious populations, religion is the primary source of coping with adversity particularly prayer, consultation with pastors or rabbis, joining and support from religious communities. I think that's particularly well proven now. One of the person who has written most on this is Professor Ken Pargeman, who's in Bowling Green University in the United States, who actually has argued that religious coping can be of two sorts. It could be positive where we see God as being friendly, close, as a source of support. It can also be negative in the sense we see God as being angry, adversity as a punishment from God. And also, if you feel that God is distant or deserted you. And interestingly, demonic attributions. If you attribute adversity to demonic attribution within Christianity, all these forms of negative religious coping can cause intensified mental health problems. And there's no doubt, if you see God as punitive or God as um, having abandoned you, levels of depression are much higher than if you see God as being supportive. So that's the literature so far. So there is some evidence now that with adversity, and particularly mass trauma, religious beliefs behave in very different ways, dependent on the various rationalizations that people use. So let me explain. There's some very good work on 9-11, looking at the role of religious beliefs, both in coping with the adversity and amongst Muslims, prayer, and amongst Christians as well, was the most important coping strategy beyond practical ways of helping, like seeking out psychological support. And there is evidence that those who prayed frequently actually did better in terms of mental health. But what happened to religious belief? What happened to Islamic beliefs? And in fact, there is a good literature now suggesting 
in the wake of 9-11 that religious belief did not diminish generally for the vast majority of people who suffered, who lost relatives. If anything, it intensified. And one of the main reasons this was because many people saw it as a trial from God or thought that God was trying to assess their faith. And this was almost a sort of theodicy. It wasn't God allowed this to happen. Something demonic happened. It was more so that we don't understand God's ways of suffering. And therefore, this is helps us cope. Ultimately, although we can never understand this as humans, and I hope I don't offend anyone by this at all, but in fact, in many religious faiths, including Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the idea that God does something ultimately for the greater good, although we as humans have very limited knowledge of divine motivation, this is actually a very protective theodicy, and in fact, can help people cope very well. So I've been over the last year examining faith during and after the Holocaust, looking at the texts which examine um, faith during the time in Auschwitz and Birkenbisch um, and various other concentration camps. And what we actually find from a number um, of um, authors is that during the Holocaust, and this is not a well-known fact, the very orthodox Jews continued practicing, although secretly, their religion. Even though they were starving to death, they would keep a small piece of bread for the Sabbath. They would make makeshift Sabbath candles out of fabric from their clothing. So even at a time when they're suffering immensely, we know that religious faith gave them a very potent way of coping. But the interesting question is, how was it that some people survived their religion, that religion survived after Auschwitz and various other aspects of the Holocaust? And one of the main findings from surveys of Holocaust survivors was that those who actually saw God as punishing them, which is contrary to what I said earlier, that punitive cognitions may actually worsen mental health. In fact, those who saw the Holocaust as a punishment were actually able to keep their relationship with God at least God did something. If they saw the Holocaust as a trial of faith, they couldn't understand why God did it, but he must have a positive purpose in assessing their faith. Again, for most people, their faith persisted, even in the wake of extreme inhumane suffering. In fact, the people who lost their religious faith during the Holocaust particularly when we interviewed Holocaust survivors, for the women, it was often seeing the horrific death of very young children, which actually made them lose their faith. There's nothing in the Hebrew Bible which ever guarantees life will always be smooth. We'll always have trials and tribulations. We always can never completely understand God's ways. And that's part of the story of Job. So for women, those who witness the horrific deaths of children often lost their faith. It wasn't because they felt that God had let them down, because they couldn't reconcile the loss of their faith, well, loss of children with God's intentions. Okay. For men, it was very different. For men, those who lost their faith, it was because of the way that the women were treated en masse, often being taken directly to the gas chamber. So it wasn't directly their belief in God 
and God letting them down was actually what they saw going on in the concentration camps. Now, finally, there is an emerging literature which suggests the following. Following adversity of any sort, a hurricane or a war or an, a pandemic, those who lose their religious faith are those who don't hold a strong theodicy. In other words, there are no protective cognitions which actually protect God from disconfirmation. So obviously one major disconfirmation with adversity is there's no God there in the first place. But again, again, we're beginning to find that theodicy protects religious cognitions. Apart from in one major set of circumstances, those who suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder are unable to process the experience of adversity using religious cognitions. In other words, you're more likely to lose your religious faith if you experience adversity and at the same time experience PTSD. And there's something about PTSD which actually inhibits cognitive processing of religious experience. So I'm just going to summarise. I realise I've got a very short period of time to talk, but I just want to summarise. So something comes very strongly from a lot of things that people have written in this book, which is question of suffering and adversity. What keeps people maintaining faith? I argue we need more empirical studies of theodicy. There are actually very few studies in the empirical literature objectifying theodicy, how you measure it, and actually how it's operationally defined. So I call for more work on theodicy not just on empirical quantitative studies, but I think we need now, both in theology and psychology of religion, to look at qualitative studies. What does adversity mean to the people who experience it? And what's its role in ameliorating or dissipating religious cognitions? Thank you. So that's just a very short overview. I'm sorry if that was a bit rushed. Thank you, Simon. That was, that was excellent. It was perfect. And it fits so well with the themes of the book and how we yeah, hope yeah. these conversations can continue. I think we could have a chance for just for one question that I'll take Chair's um, um, privilege to, to ask is, what lessons do you think from the research and your experience so far um, with the, the traumas that you've observed from your patients' experiences, now there's a more of a collective sense because of the, the, the traumas that health professionals are experiencing that are akin to the ones that their patients are experiencing. What lessons do you think are important to carry forward when, when developing mental health in uh, globally? Um, often mental health systems that in low resource countries, what are the, the lessons that we need to carry forward for how we can transform the traumas from the pandemic? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Having worked for a year, having had COVID and having worked through COVID and having seen several patients die with COVID, I think that the attitude of health service staff now has changed. I think in many ways, it's made many people more compassionate and to realize as well, there's not a great gap between patients and staff, okay? I think tragically, the questions about how COVID pandemic has impacted on mental health staff globally is not something empirically has been looked at. But I think that what we've learned is that you are human and you have limits to what you can do. And I think in a very overstretched service, particularly in you know, countries, low to middle income countries, 
I think there would be an urgent need to provide extra support to staff who are looking after people with COVID. But unfortunately, I don't think that's imminently going to happen. One of the things I found with COVID, which I find most tragic, is that although we predicted back over a year ago, the demise of inequality, and I think global capitalism as we know it, unfortunately, the rich have prospered over COVID and the poor have become poorer. And I think although we thought that attitudes may well change towards inequality, I don't think that's really been borne out over the COVID era. But in response to Aisha, I think that what we've actually learned is that people need a lot more support than they've actually been given. Thank you, Simon. I mean, that's quite a somber thought, but it's also very important that we we know that we need to have better ways of perceiving and also receiving suffering. And with that, hopefully yeah. we can counteract the inequalities that have become magnified rather than enhancing them as we continue forwards. Um, I'll hand over. Thank you so much, Simon, on behalf of Lovely. us all. Have a um, nice evening, everyone. I hope it's warm in your countries <laughs> where you are. And let's Thank meet you. up. I haven't seen you for about two years. I'm around <laughs> over the summer. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, Simon. I'll hand over to my colleague now, Dr. Martha, who's going to chair the closing comments. Thank you so much. Um, and I think uh, I think the first word in the comments was to go to a colleague from uh, Diak in Helsinki, Mikko Makelvara. Uh, and uh, I'm lucky to have the last word today. So I will uh, I will hand straight over to you, Mikko. I really want to thank you all for these fine presentations we have heard today. And as you said, Martha, I will greet you on behalf of the Diakonia University of Applied Sciences, an organization to which Ville Päivänsalo joined last year. Diakonia University, or Diak, as we call it shortly, got its somewhat biblical name in 1996 when it was founded by church-based educational institutions. There was a big renewal of higher education system in Finland, and then those church-based institutions noticed they had to join together if they wanted to lift their degrees on the academic higher educational level. Diakonia means service, but it means also social care, Christian social practice and Christian nursing. Nowadays, Diak is the biggest educational organization in the field of social services in Finland, and also a quite big uh, factor in nursing. But while we are today celebrating the book of faith-based health justice, we can say the book represents the essence and very care, or very core of the Diakonia University. With these emphasizes, of his ex expertise. Ville has come to a house where this kind of thinking and this kind of skills are highly appreciated. Diakonia University of Applied Sciences was founded by church-based organizations and about one quarter of its students have chosen their studies so they are able to work within the church. But naturally, the value basis is plural. And therefore, maybe we could say that more than church-based or faith-based, the Diakonia University is value-based. And if I try to define how it is value-based. 
I could describe is I could describe it uh, human rice based, and when we or when I think about the new book, I would say that I regard it very much of Wille's book. I think maybe it it has something to do that uh, Wille has just uh, finished also this justice with health large book and therefore i i think about uh the role of villa of this kind of thinking and in one of his earlier works villa paivansalo formulated a reconstructive account of justice referring to it as earthly justice he defined it its broader framework in terms of neighborly love, cooperation, and narrative sensitivity. As the key criteria of justice in this account, he defended lawfulness, fairness, merit, truthfulness, and faithfulness to one's conscience. And furthermore, Willet presents his readers a call to brave thinking and to a bold defense of justice. I'm very proud of my new colleague, Ville, and I greet this new book of a sign of brave thinking and bold defense of justice. I thank you all for this very pleasant and interesting event and its fresh ideas. I feel privileged when I had the possibility to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikko. Um, and uh, uh, that means that I get the chance to give the word to myself uh, to, to round off today's discussion. And before I, I thank all of the participants and, and round off completely, I'd, um, I'd like to give a couple of reflections from my perspective. Um, as Josephine said at the start, I'm, uh, my name is Martha Middlemas Lamont. I'm the um, director of the Center for Multidisciplinary Research on Religion and Society at Uppsala University, where Josephine is an affiliated researcher. And this is an organization uh, which focuses, as its name says, on research on religion and the intersection with other societal issues uh, and focuses on looking at these in a multidisciplinary plenary perspective and therefore I was delighted to get the opportunity to say something today and also to highlight a book like this which has done just that um, really borne down in detail in, in excellent research um, but done so in dialogue between different uh, disciplines in into a, a field of research which is of crucial um, importance to the development of societies around the world today and uh, at our research centre, we uh, were host for 10 years for a, a research programme called The Impact of Religion Challenges for Society, Law and Democracy, and strive to continue researching uh, it under that sort of strapline, the impact of religion. What impact can religion have on, on society and developments around the world, and also what, what impact can developments have on the development of religion? And I think... Um, the discussion that's been had today shows that that the work that we are interested in doing along alongside international partners is of key importance, not least in the health, uh, well-being and welfare area, um, which is one of the topics that we also focus on. And the key question I often ask myself when I'm at events like this, then, is 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 where where are the gaps? Where is the need for new research at the intersection of these important issues? Um, I'd like to thank Professor Marshall particularly for uh, the sort of beginning of our, of our session today for highlighting uh, the fact that it is the complex roles of religion and religious actors in this field are rarely looked at. This is something, what, what's been done in this book is something that not many people have been worked on and where, uh, where there's a lot left to be done that's both of interest to the research community but also for practitioners um, trying to grapple with these issues on the ground. Um, it's something that we've noticed at our research centre in many areas beyond the health field as well, that religion is rarely taken seriously, as it has been in the studies in this volume. And it's been good to see 
uh, work on the intersections of religion that that shown in this volume with markets, with historical legacy, with law, with governance and with government. Um, and so I look forward to seeing sort of further collaborations come out of, uh, of the, the interaction that this volume has brought. And I'd like to conclude by, by just highlighting two issues which I've seen sort of handled a little bit in this volume, which are discussions today, which have taken even more of a focus on, on the COVID pandemic and the implications that that have had, that, that I sort of came to my mind when I was reading um, and also listening to you here today. Uh, the first one is the issue of religion blindness. Um, that, that is often discussed and that I thought came to my mind particularly when Professor Marshall was talking about the ad religion and stir method. From a Swedish perspective, um, uh, and uh, here I recognize myself in my, my Finnish colleagues talking uh, as well, uh, it's not, of, it's not um, often a case of ad religion and stir, but rather take religion out of the recipe and see what we can do without it um, perspective. And Vila talked about uh, leaving the colonial legacy behind, this issue of what does the colonial legacy do. Um, in the Swede formation of the Swedish welfare state, there was often a, an attempt to, um, to leave behind religious involvement, to say thank you and goodbye to the religious actors that have been an important aspect of the healthcare system. And so what I think is interesting in this volume is that it brings back into a debate, certainly in the Western European context, of where are we religious bl religion blind in relation to uh, actors in the welfare sector? Uh, there's plenty of evidence that supports in the Swedish context what uh, Henriette Grönland was saying about the Finnish context, that in the COVID pandemic, the Church of Sweden has been one of the major actors uh, in, in supporting individuals under the pandemic, and has also been one of the civil society organisations that has received the most government funding to support its work in this area. So again, a sort of financial recognition of the fact that it's providing a service of importance. Um, I'd also like to pick up on what um, Simon Dean was talking about in terms of, of coping strategies and the problems of religious blindness, um, that, the problems that religious blindness can bring in, in that sort of aspect. I was talking to a, a colleague recently who's retiring, uh, and there's, but has also started taking on some more clinical work, um, given the huge need for um, support in health, mental health areas uh, during the COVID pandemic in Sweden. And she was rung up by a referral patient who said, with sort of some surprise in his voice, I've been told that you can work with religion. Is that true? Um, so I think and I think that's a very interesting example of the fact of, of how we deal in, in this sort of Swedish and to a large extent the wider Western European context, where even bringing religion into a discussion of these sorts of issues of health and well-being is still it's still the strange bird in the room. The second thing that I would like to mention just very quickly um, is, is the combination of the things we're talking about today with the interesting religious shifts that are going on a lot around, both within individual contexts, but also also globally. Um, we see, a, as, you, as several people have already talked about today, a huge legacy of the colonial past that defines the way that religious actors work within particular healthcare systems. Um, but at the, and that, that, that historical legacy remains and is very powerful. Um, at the same time, we're seeing considerable uh, shifts. One example being the the rise of Pentecostalism globally as a religious movement within within as a sort of Christ expression of Christianity, for example, um, and and how that that sort of shift uh, in religious adherence doesn't necessarily connect to the way that religion acts as an actor within healthcare systems. Um, and I think that the work that's been done in this book and several of the chapters here um, highlights the fact that we need more knowledge about that um, if we're going to be able to, as researchers, support the, the sort of knowledge need that's on the ground. So I would like, therefore, to sort of end my comments by saying thank you so much to everybody 
today for taking part for the discussions that have gone on. Uh, thank you to all of the authors, both those who commented today, but the, the authors also wrote chapters that were, we didn't have time to present today. Uh, and I would um, recommend those of you who haven't had a chance to see the volume yet to go out to get hold of it and read it. There's um, there's a wealth of information there that is a start to this conversation as the editors wrote in the beginning they were finishing this volume as the covid pandemic started to take hold um, and there's a whole new volume to be written Villa and Aisha I think when you've got your breath back you can just start again on the next <laughs> on the next project um, so with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you, particular thank to, to our special guests uh, who, who gave our keynote lecture today to Professor Marshall and to Simon Dean for these inputs that they put. And I would like to, and to all of my uh, colleagues at the other partners for organizing this webinar. It's been great fun to collaborate with you on this as well. And um, I hope that everybody after this goes and gets hold of the book and has some fun summer reading to take with them. Thank you very much. And good morning, good evening or good night to all of you wherever you are.